It's good to be with you again. We're continuing our study on how to avoid deception. We can't avoid being in a world that's filled with deception. That's our reality. In fact, we've almost made it a virtue. You know, in business, if you're deceitful and you improve your outcome, we call it good business. In sports, we call it hiding your game plan. We, we've come up with a whole new vocabulary that enables us to, to kind of sanctify deception. But in the end, it's not a good thing. We want to be champions for the truth. We want to be advocates for the truth. We want to be people who learn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We don't have to be frightened. Jesus told us this was a characteristic of this season in human history. So we've been forewarned, and if Jesus warned us, he'll help us be prepared. We're going to open our Bibles and see if we can understand how to find stability and to find our pathway through a season when deception is the norm. It's an exciting time you and I have to put our faith and trust in a living God and be ambassadors for Jesus of Nazareth to prepare for the return of the King and the expansion of his kingdom. Grab your Bible, get a notepad, most of all, open your heart. I trust God has something for us today. Enjoy the lesson. Well, hello, church. How did it hurt your feelings that we're inside tonight? No, okay. If it'd been snowing, we'd be out there, but we've done the rain thing. We got that in our passport already marked, so we thought we could socially distance our way into the building tonight. So we're glad you're here, and we're glad you're joining us online, wherever you're watching from. Uh, it is a privilege to be with God's people. Amen. What an honor we have to worship the Lord together. Amen. You know, there's, there's been a heaviness. Well, I, I talk to Christians across the country on a pretty regular basis, and there's been a heaviness, almost a sense of despair. And it, it is, it's been pervasive, and it's been a little bit unrelenting. So I, I did a little research. Uh, I've been trained on how to do research in your Bible, and I've got good news. Apparently, we win. Huh? Well, I, 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 got a, I got a follow up. Jesus of Nazareth is still on the throne. He has the name that's above every name. Every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I commend you, you're early adopters. It will go better with you that way. So lift up your head and stand tall and, and push back on the darkness that you feel. Jesus, I, I checked. and it, it, I can tell you from scripture, there is no panic in heaven tonight. Amen. The angels are not pacing, wringing their hands. Amen. They're not looking for caves or dehydrated food. It's all good. Woo. Take a deep breath. The king has got this. Amen. Now we have an assignment and there may be some components of that require a little lifting on our part, but he'll help us. Hot dog, I'm telling you. We were guilty of getting our attention focused on some wrong things and God just keeps recalibrating. Have you felt like that? I felt like since last March, he said, watch this, no, watch this, no, watch. I'm mean, like, yes, okay, I got this. It's hard to hold, but God is good to us. God is good to us. All right, offertory prayers. We gotta thank God. We have to thank God for his goodness to us. He's our sustainer and our provider. He's watching over us. I was in the lobby for a little bit tonight and the teenagers were coming in. It makes me smile. Dozens and dozens, hundreds of those little rascals coming in here. They're not little anymore. They're looking me in the eye. They're having pizza. Do you know how much pizza a couple hundred teenagers can eat? It tastes like a panel truck. And if you get between them and the pizza, you'll need to believe in healing. I think we ought to pray for them. Why don't you stand with me? That God would pour out his spirit on the young people in our nation. Would that not be wonderful to see? It'd make me smile to see college campuses with the spirit of God moving across them. Huh? He can do that. It starts in our hearts with the willingness to believe that God can. 
I know you know the story, but when I was a little boy, my, the, the doctors told my mom she had six months to live. We went to church and we weren't Christians, but we went every week. You know, you can do that. You can do that here if you choose. And that she was on the way to a, a hospital for massive surgery. And she prayed a prayer that if there was a God before she died, that she could know the truth so she could tell her boys. I've got brothers. And some, t- some hours later, a doctor came in a room in the middle of the night and said, Ms. Jackson, we can't find all those tumors and masses that are in the x-rays. And, and, and we didn't check any of the boxes. We were pagans. We weren't even Christians. We didn't know how to pray. We didn't know what scripture was. We didn't know how to believe. There wasn't anybody standing with us. God just intervened. My mom's still here. But my takeaway from that is that God can. And you can fill in the blank. It doesn't mean he answers every prayer or, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't go through hard places. And I'm not suggesting that, but I'm telling you, God can. And if we will open our hearts to him, we will see God do things that you have not seen anywhere in your journey up to this point. You won't have to fabricate God's stories. You'll, you will tell them cautiously because you'll be concerned people won't believe them. That's what's in front of us. I promise you, you're not defeated. But we're learning to trust the Lord in new ways, to open our hearts to him, to yield our lives to him. We know how to have church, but we're learning how to follow the Lord. That is such a, such a wonderful season in our lives. It's the, it's the most remarkable invitation. It's, it's more valuable than any graduate course you could enroll in. And God in his mercy has called us and, and put us in school. Yeah. So we're going to pray for kids, young people, for an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Do you know somebody that's under 20? If you don't, I can hook you up with somebody with a name and a picture and a prayer. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us and you care for us, that you've kept us and watched over us. We pray for those tonight that are sick. Lord, I pray that they would heal supernaturally. May they respond to any treatments that are being given, Lord, cause their bodies to to recuperate and recover far ahead of anticipated schedules. I thank you for it. Lord, I thank you for your great mercy in our lives. We pause tonight, Lord, to pray for our young people. I thank you for them. Thank you for their great energy, for the dreams they hold. Lord, you know each and every one of them. You created them. You've known them before we have. And we ask for a moving of your spirit amongst our young people. Lord, in our schools, in our colleges, in our universities, in our churches, Lord, may we see it move across our nation. May we hear report after report after report. May those who have opposed you stand in confusion and perplexity at the changes that are coming to their hearts and their value systems for the hopes and the dreams that they will begin to verbalize. We thank you for it, Lord, that you'll deliver them. Deliver them from the spirit of this world and awaken them to your eternal kingdom. We cry out to you tonight on their behalf, Lord. We thank you for them. We praise you for them, and we look expectantly forward to seeing what you will do, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You can have a seat if you can stand it. You better buckle up. I'm telling you, God is moving. My Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a banner against him. And we've seen some floods. I mean, we've been sheltered in place and all sorts of stuff, but God is moving. Hallelujah. That's not on my outline, so don't, that's, that doesn't come off my time. <laughs> We're not leaving until the kids have eaten all the pizza. <laughs> About 10 minutes probably, right? <laughs> it's like locust. <laughs> all right, I want to continue a theme we began on was that this past week on do not be deceived. And I just like to pick up where I left that off. So if you didn't have an opportunity to hear that particular talk, uh, it lives out there somewhere in the clouds. 
And it, it's, thank God for that. We are able to, we have friends that we share ministry and we are um, standing with quite literally around the world. It's amazing how technology enabled, has enabled us to shrink the globe. And even in a season when we don't have the freedom to travel, we have the freedom to stand together in prayer. And it is a tremendous gift. So I make a bit of light of that. But So this is really an extenu, extenu, a continuation of that. Um, in, in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, but consistently in Scripture, when it talks about the end of the age, almost inevitably there's a warning against deception. They go together. And I am not a timeline person in the sense that I'm not telling you I think we're within three years of this or that. But the Bible says we can know the general season in which we live. And without question, from my perspective, we are in that season that the Bible describes as the end of the age. And so the characteristics that go with that are as certain as the characteristics that will come with spring in a few weeks. Things will begin to turn green and the daffodils in Tennessee will begin to bloom again. And the dogwood trees and the red buds will begin to bloom. And those of you that are sensitive to those events will stop breathing. <laughs> and because of all the COVID awareness, it'll cause anxiety. Those things are in our future. They come with the next season. Between here and there, it's going to be chilly and damp in Tennessee. And it will snow in Ohio and we will close our schools <laughs> as a show of support for our brethren. But one of the characteristics biblically as we approach the end of the age is this notion of deception. And it seems to me that you don't need a great deal of discernment to say deception is increasing. In fact, it's, it's increasing at such a rate that it's really disorienting. Personally, I feel like we're caught in a riptide. You know, if you've ever, or in, in something, if you've ever stood in the, in the ocean and you felt the waves receding and you just feel the pull and sometimes if it's stormy and you know, that's much stronger. And I have that sense that the deception that's crashing over us and washing around us, it, 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 it tends to pull at your balance and leave you a little disoriented. And, it comes from every place. It's not coming from a single source. It's not about a political party or a particular media outlet, or it's not even about just social things. Some is coming from religious fronts. It's from every ideological vantage point. And it leaves us kind of disoriented and a little unstable, and you get tired because it takes energy to maintain your stability. And if you don't guard your heart, you find your heart thinking, I just want to get through this time. I want to get back to a stable place where I don't have to listen to the Lord carefully. Where, you know, reading my Bible doesn't feel essential. It could move back into the kind of a nice category. I don't know that we're going back to that place. The resolution to seasons of deception is truth. Truth brings freedom. And deception, particularly further deception, will bring rebellion. So it's important, the struggle to identify the truth and align yourself with truth is very much worth the effort. And I just jotted down some examples of deception and I'm not, you can take almost any arena you want. We can take hard sciences and, and science is being co-opted by politics. And it means we get conflicting reports. And much more so than in previous seasons. It's happened at other times in human history, but not in the magnitude and the scale and the frequency with which we watch today. When, when there are social changes being pushed at us, we are far enough into the, to the post-enlightenment world. We know we're irrational people, so they start saying this has to be supported with science. And and, and they'll begin bringing us fractured science, and it's disorienting. We've watched it with COVID. COVID's real, no question. And if you're not praying for our frontline healthcare workers, you need to be. They've stood, if you think you're tired, they've stood on the front line now for many months, caring for people and, and working under tremendous pressure, and often, at least initially, with limited knowledge. But the COVID rules have changed day to day. 
week to week, city to city, state to state. Well, that's not the normal response you would imagine if it was simply a matter of facts and testing a hypothesis. We just finished an election season. If anything feels like it's fraught with deception, it's elections. Everybody promises something different at the next microphone, forgetting that the videotape was running at the last one. And they're not embarrassed. They don't feel ashamed. There doesn't seem anything awkward about it. Christian messaging isn't much better about how to vote or for whom to vote or one candidate's wicked and another's evil. I mean, it is, it is a, it's unprecedented, the kind of deception. The media at one time was a trusted part of our society to provide for us something close to, at least, a neutral source of information. And they've almost totally abandoned themselves to propaganda, to an ideological viewpoint that they're determined to, to, to establish in the hearts and minds of our, our culture. Censorship, monitoring what we're allowed to listen to without apology. Telling us it's too dangerous to listen to. Folks, we're the largest creator of pornography in the world and we've defended it based on free speech. And now they're censoring our things. We understand fundamentally there's something wrong with that. We all understand our telephones have been used for just about every form of imaginable evil. It never occurred to us somebody should tell us we can't talk on the phone because we used an unkind word in our last conversation. There, there's so many predictive voices. And they're at odds with one another. Some of them are Christian voices and they speak with real authority and some of them will tag God's name in there and you're reluctant to, to push back against that. But it's not just within Christendom. In, in economic and political circles, there's no shortage of experts that seem to have inside knowledge and they're going to tell us what's about to happen. And when it doesn't, they, they morph again into something else and nobody ever comes back and says, well, that was wrong. In, in more subtle ways, they're, they're not subtle, but in churches, entire denominations, mainline denominations are rejecting orthodoxy and the authority of the word of God. It's deceptive. It's disorienting. We see leaders that we elect to powerful offices in our nation refuse to put our national interests first. That's not limited to a single party. But you watch that, it's disorienting. It's confusing. When we see individuals that we, we ask to lead us or invite to lead us, and they put personal interest or personal power or the accumulation of resources ahead of the community's well-being, you might be able to explain it in terms of a character flaw, but it adds to this milieu of deception. And on top of that, we battle it ourselves. We've made all sorts of allowances for it, incrementally, bit by bit. We have expressions like, you know, let the buyer beware. Implying that if the person doing the selling can deceive you, it's on your head. May I suggest to you from a biblical perspective, let the seller beware. Because if you practice deception, eventually you're going to meet with our boss. Amen. Now, I grew up in the horse business in Tennessee. And I promise you, buyer beware is the rule of thumb in that world. They say the last place a horse trader wants to look is in your eye. If you've never traded for a horse, you've got no idea what I'm talking about, but it's all right. You know, I think fundamentally this comes back to a personal commitment to integrity. I mean, with the tenacity that we have let go of within the church. 
See, none of the things that I, I can list or see, and I, it's startling what we watch happen. I, I listened to a presentation yesterday, uh, redefining policy in our nations best, best, based upon equity. Not equality, equity, a, a complete repositioning of how we would imagine we would interact with one another without explanation, without any debate, just the delivery of a new policy. We've heard in recent days and weeks and months increasing conversation about how our gender is fluid. Again, you know, I grew up in rural Tennessee. I've filled out all sorts of registration certificates on animals, puppies and horses and you know, they have to be registered according to their breed. And every one of those forms said male or female. I didn't meet one fluid critter. <laughs> and I don't say that to be angry at anyone. I'm telling you, all of this together leaves us a bit unsteady. And I honestly think it's part of the agenda because when you're unsteady, you're more easily moved. You know, the truth is in Ephesians, it says having done everything to stand, stand therefore. And you're more stable this way, but, but you also can't make any progress. If you're going to move, if you're going to walk just in your person, you have to break equilibrium. You have to get a little bit off balance. And, and then you've got all these internal things that start firing and making decisions. So how you get to a stable place before you fall. And the only way to make progress forward is to be destabilized enough that, that, that all of those instincts will fire to help you move yourself forward. And you accelerate it, you run. But, but once you get your momentum going forward, you're, you're much easier to redirect in whatever direction. And I think what we're watching is a, an unprecedented, I've, I've been saying for months now, spiritual conflict, a battle for the heart and soul of our nation. And so we have to know what it is that gives us stability. Because Jesus told us, and, and many other of our friends in the New Testament told us, and the Bible told us, that deception is a part of this season. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 says, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. And then Proverbs 23, 23 gives us the alternative. It says, Buy the truth and don't sell it. Buy the truth. It's very clear. It's, it's, it's so plain you could walk past it. There's a price to be paid for the truth. If you're going to know the truth, it's going to require something of you. Well, I don't like that. Okay. Pay the price anyway. Well, I wish it were free. Okay. Pay the price. Well, I don't think that's fair. Okay. When you create your own world, you can make your rules. The counsel we're given by the creator is by the truth. So I want to give you a handful of, of, I guess we can call them principles, to help you stay free of deception. Now, the best news I have is that Jesus gave us the warning. And if he gave us the warning, then we don't have to succumb to deception. If Jesus said, don't be afraid, I know I can tell you one thing for sure, you don't have to be afraid. When he said, do not worry, I, I can tell you for certain, you don't have to lead a life plagued by worry. And when he said, don't be deceived, there, there's good news thundering through the heavens. You don't have to be overcome by deception. Amen. That's good. <laughs> but it's equally true that you know what it is to battle fear and you know what it is to wrestle with anxiety and worry. And so it's highly probable that we're going to have a little wrestling match or some challenges with deception. Don't be frightened by it. So these are simple. These, this is not rocket science. This is plain language. It, it's, this is my, it's where I live. The first is it's, it's only by God's mercy that we can be faithful. Just settle it in your heart. You're not going to outthink evil. You're not going to outwork evil. At the end of the day, it's only by God's mercy that you and I can remain faithful. There's such freedom in that. God, I'm yours. I trust you. I don't mean that in a passive way, in a resigned way. I don't mean that in, a, in a, an attitude of surrender. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, I gave an opinion, I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. 
Paul is writing to a church that he has helped birth. And he said, I'm giving you an opinion, but it's only by God's mercy that I can stand. And if you will establish that in your heart, so one of the challenges that we religious folk have is self-righteousness and pride. We belong to the right group. We read the right Bible. You know, we, we believe the right things. And I'm grateful for the struggle to know the truth and the effort you invest in that. But understand, it's God's mercy that enables us to stand. Amen. He called us out of darkness. He redeemed us. We did not save ourselves. He called us long before we responded to him. Amen. You know, as a younger person, I, I thought me joining God's team was probably a huge relief to him. <laughs> and from where I stand today, I understand a little bit about the enormous liability they accepted when they allowed me in. And it's only by the grace of God. The second thing I would add to that is cultivate, which means purposefully, intentionally, do anything you can to increase the harvest of humility and the fear of the Lord. Psalm 25 says, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. How do you enlist God to guide you by cultivating humility. As I understand scripture, you have two choices. You can humble yourself or you can face humiliation. I've been in both lines. It's better if we humble ourselves. Humility is not something you can acquire directly. You can't order it on Amazon. I'm sure that annoys them to no end. <laughs> but humility comes to you through engaging in other behaviors when you serve other people, when you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, when you submit yourself to the authority of Scripture, when you will allow God's priorities to become your priorities, when you submit to the authority of biblical worldviews on issues of sexuality or how you handle your money, or how you treat one another, or your willingness to forgive. Every time you submit to the authority of God, you increase your capacity for humility. And every time you reject it and say, I'll do it my way, or I don't believe I have to do that, or that doesn't apply to me, or I can still go to heaven and ignore that portion, you give root to pride. That battle lives within every one of us consistently. Don't be offended by that. There, there are certain routines for your physical hygiene that you need to practice regularly or you're not pleasant, <laughs> nor am I. You know, I, I, I had a report from somebody that had been sick for a few days and they said it was the first time in, in a week they'd, they'd been strong enough to take a shower. I was happy just to receive that report over the phone. <laughs> I was good with that. It's all the information I needed. Personal experience was not required. But in the same way that physically you understand that there are some things that you need to give attention to on a routine basis or you're, you become increasingly less pleasant, the same is true with your spiritual condition. James says that we look into the, the, the mirror of the Word of God and we go away and immediately forget what we saw that we have to consistently, repeatedly look back again into that mirror. So don't, be, don't feel threatened or put off or annoyed by the fact that the tension between pride and humility persists in your life. If an archangel, Satan, could be so overcome with pride that it led him to rebellion against God, I think we should understand we're vulnerable. Psalm 25 and verse 12 says, Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He'll instruct him in the way chosen for him. He'll spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. 
The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. There are, there are very few things in scripture that have more promises attached to them than the fear of the Lord. And it's not cowering in dread or terror at the thought of God. It's about respect, reverence, a sense of awe. God's not like us. We're created in his image, but we're not, we don't represent all that he is. We have access to his kingdom. And sometimes in our attempts to, to bring God down to a relatable level, I think we, we, res, we relinquish too much of the respect and reverence for the Lord. My personal opinion, I hear people say, you know, I just want to go love on Jesus. And I, I think I understand the, the, the attitude or the intent when that's said, but I'm not really comfortable with that notion. Imagine you had a meeting with the governor, and I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just going over to love on the governor. <laughs> well, I think I'll put on a coat and tie, and if I'm given the opportunity, I'll shake his hand. Do you understand? God deserves our worship. Not because his ego is so fragile that he loses perspective if we don't say, hey, you're really swell. We need the discipline of worship to remind us he's the creator of all things and the sustainer of all things, that he names the planets. He let us name the animals. There's a lot more planets and he calls them by name. He names the stars in the heavens. The respect for God. You believe your Bible. You bet I do. What about the parts I don't understand? I'm learning. I'm learning. Number three goes right along with that. Base everything on the scriptures. If you want to be free from deception, spend time putting the word of God in your heart. First, we have general revelation. What you learn from studying the scripture about the character of God and how he interacts with his people and his perspective on human behavior and the boundaries he set around us. And that when he said, thou shalt not, he meant that. First, we have general revelation. Then we can seek for personal revelation. You know, years ago, somebody said to me, well, the Bible doesn't say go to Little Rock and turn left. And there's times we need direction and the Bible doesn't give us the, the specificity with which we would like it. But in my life experience, in my ministry experience, there is no personal revelation if you're not living within the general revelation of the truth of God's word. Why should God help you clarify the decision points before you if you're ignoring the clear truth that you know? Again, the topic is how do we avoid deception? And, and the, the real invitation, as I understand this season, church, is God is asking us to be different. I'm not concerned about the darkness. I'm concerned about the hearts of God's people. We've been a little smog. We've, we've been born again, and we, we've, we've checked most of the boxes, and we're not living in gross, blatant sin. So, you know, a little bit here and a little bit, you know, it's okay. It's like God's going to grade on a curve. None of us are perfect. Absolutely right, we're not perfect, but that's not an excuse for sloppiness. We have no right to anticipate God's direction if we're not living in the revealed will of God. So it's very helpful to have a consistent dialogue with the Lord. If it's not a matter of your weekly spiritual disciplines, it should be. Lord, if there's any place where the momentum of my life or the trajectory of my life is, is taking me away from your best, help me to see it. If I'm watching anything, if I'm, if I'm meditating on anything, if there are any relationships in my life that are damaging that, if I'm, if I'm not, help me, Lord, I want to get this right. You've got to care as much about your, your spiritual hygiene as you do your physical presentation. Again, not a burden, not a threat. The outcomes are so amazing. We need God's help. God is not a burden. Is there any place in your life you've gotten to know the Lord and he has diminished you? He certainly hasn't me. Now, at the time I was choosing the Lord, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to give this up for the Lord. You ever felt like that? Well, I guess I'm going to have to turn loose of this relationship. Oh. You look back on it in six months and say, oh, God, thank you. 
Right? But in the moment you're making the decision, you think, ah. Oh. I mean, that is the, 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 that's the emotion of maturing and growing up and learning. You see it in your little people. Base everything on the Word of God. Number four is focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Revelation 19. I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do it. I'm a fellow servant with you. It's an angel that's showing John this revelation. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every true prophecy points us towards and exalts Jesus. There's going to be more prophecy, more prophets, more false prophets. And, and don't just think of prophets in terms of religious characters. Biblical prophecy is God's perspective on where we are. False prophets are spe people that try to define truth for you, and it's not really true. They may be religious characters, and they may use scriptures, and they may, they may say, thus saith the Lord. They may be totally secular characters, but they're trying to define truth for you. If it doesn't line up with the scripture, if it doesn't create in you the fear of the Lord, if it doesn't bring you back to the dependence upon the redemptive work of Jesus, it's not true. Focus on Jesus. John 16, Jesus is speaking, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth and he'll not speak on his own. He'll speak only to what he hears and he'll tell you what is yet to come. He'll bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. The supreme purpose of the Holy Spirit is not to let us run the aisles. I'm okay with that, but that's not the goal. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. And if you desire a, a greater presence of the Spirit of God in your life, I can tell you the short course, begin to honor Jesus with your words and your attitudes, with the conversations you have, with how you interact with people. You will attract the presence of the Spirit of God. He comes where Jesus is being lifted up. You watch sometime when we're together with the community of faith and we begin to talk about the person of Jesus and celebrate who he is and what he's done for us and the magnificence of his sacrifice and his great love for his people and what he revealed to us about God the Father. As we start through that, whether it's his names or the titles attributed to him or we start to read the verses of Scripture, you, you pay attention to the spirit that fills the room when we do that. You can do that same thing at home. You start to thank him for who he is and what he's done for you. The Spirit of God will meet you. Number five, leave the initiative with God. And again, these are practical. This is, don't worry God for revelation. No, it says in Deuteronomy that the secret things belong to the Lord, but the revealed things belong to us. And there's some things God didn't intend for us to know. I, I, again, I'm an advocate for study. I like to find print. I've given a lot of time and energy to it. I think language studies are helpful in some ways. I'm not diminishing that. But folks, there's things God hasn't told us. What do you think happened before Genesis 1? I don't know. He didn't tell us. Well, don't you want to know? No, I'm good. Well, you're not very inquisitive. That's because I can't keep up with the truth of God. Amen. Loving my neighbor as myself is just about a full-time job. And I've moved a few times because I thought it had to be the neighbors I had. <laughs> but you know, after a handful of moves, you realize it's not them. <laughs> Whew. Psalm, Psalm 131. It says, my heart is not proud, O Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Now I have participated in thousands of worship services. And healthy babies make noise. Okay? Don't pinch them because the sermon's dull and you want to leave. That's not good. But there comes a point in their life when they're weaned and their routine and their development grows and that there's a different level of demeanor that comes with them. 
And that's when I read that passage, that's the image it brings to me. He said, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. It says, my heart is not proud, Lord. I'm not haughty. I, I don't concern myself with matters that are too wonderful for me. And again, I'm not coaching you towards passivity. I'm telling you, you can leave the initiative with God. Be faithful in the place he has put you with the diligence that you would want somebody to be, have if you had given them an assignment. Number six, beware of fantasy. Or maybe said a different way, limit your exposure to fantasy. There seems to me to be a spirit of fantasy that has just multiplied over us. There are so many that don't even recognize the difference any longer between what they're absorbing, whether it's real or fantasy. Now, some of our digital tools have, have contributed to that. So the, the amount of programming that is available contributes to that. Our affluence and abundance contributes to that. The connectivity of our world contributes to that. We used to lead much more isolated lives and we didn't have exposure to so much. Now we, we see so many things and that fantasy makes you dissatisfied and discontent. And it will lead you to places that are destructive. Makes you more easily deceived, more easily dissatisfied. More easily many things. Don't give your thoughts or your focused attention to things that aren't grounded by the boundaries of Scripture. Fascinate comes, the root of it is a Latin word that means to be bewitched. And too much fantasy will bewitch you. Again, our objective here is what can we do, what are the practices that we can build into our lives that will help us stay free of deception in a season when deception is going to be increasing. Number seven, and my last one on this little list, is just keep it simple and plain. Don't be so spiritual. I've told the story before. Years ago, I, had, I was a young man, and I was asked to take a visiting minister to the airport. And on the way, we were supposed to stop, and, and he was going to pray for somebody, and I had an address. This was before Google or before GPS. We, we, we used to do this quaint thing. Somebody would hand you an address, and we had these paper things that unfolded. And so I had a street no name and his number, and I couldn't find the house. And I was embarrassed, and we had a flight to catch, and I, I, I wanted to be a good host. And I, I finally said, well, I guess the devil didn't want us to pray for that person. And this guy was a retired army. He had this huge, deep voice. He said, devil nothing. You just had lousy directions, son. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. <laughs> and sometimes... In our shortcomings, we over-spiritualize things and keep it simple and plain. Corey Ten Boom, do you know her? Amen. If you've never read The Hiding Place, I recommend it to you. It's not a new book, but it's worth the read. She's a hero in my life. But I don't think she originated it, but I heard her use it. The KISS principle, just keep it simple, stupid, works for me. First, 2 Corinthians 3, I'm sorry, it says, therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. We're not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel wouldn't look intently at the end of what was fading away. In the Old Testament, the presentation is veiled to a degree. We see God through types and signs and patterns. But in the New Testament, there's great plainness of speech, and that's what Paul is saying. I have a hope for great boldness in our speech. It's not hidden any longer. It's been made plain. And God isn't hiding. I, I'm always a bit intrigued at the way we title sermons. You know, the, the seven hidden keys to, and the 12 great secrets and the four mysteries. I'm like, no, it seems to me like God said it about as plainly as he knows how. No man comes to the Father except through me. I mean, it's, it's a very plain presentation. The simplest amongst us can understand it. So let me, I'll recapitulate just real quickly. It's only by God's mercy that we can be faithful. Number two, cultivate humility in the fear of the Lord. Three, base everything on the scriptures. 
Four, focus on Jesus. He's more important than the label of the church where we serve or the translation of our Bible or the style of worship music we prefer. Number five, leave the initiative with God. Don't pester God for greater revelation. Focus on the truth he's given you. Number six, beware of fantasy. And seven, keep it simple and plain. They're guardrails to help you stay out of places that make you more vulnerable to deception. There's some things you do that make you susceptible to deception. I'll give you four and I'm done. I'll touch them real quickly. Those who rely on this, on just a subjective impression. I've spent a lot of time in, in, in Christian circles and people say, well, it felt so good. I know it was from God. Subjective impressions are not the best guidelines for your life. They were cute. They had to love Jesus. Number two, those who accept supernatural signs as a guarantee of truth. One of the most supernatural individuals that will ever stand on the face of planet Earth will be the Antichrist and the false prophet. Miracles are not an attestation of character. I'm not opposed to miracles and the supernatural, but don't allow them to be your, your signposts for what is true. Number three, it's the fruit of the Spirit, right? Right? That's another lesson. We'll do it another time. Number three, those who are willing to face the, who are, those who are unwilling to face the possibility of suffering or persecution are more vulnerable to deception. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have trouble. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. None of our heroes got through the journey without some adversity. So don't cultivate a, 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 a faith or a theological plan or a view of the world that says you're not going to have to walk through anything. Doesn't mean you failed or you missed God. And that's not a negative confession or being something less than positive. Christ suffered in the flesh and God honored him. Anyone who promises you only good is a false prophet. And then number four, you're susceptible if you have no awareness of scripture or limited awareness of scripture. You're vulnerable to what anyone would say. We have the Bible available to us. Invest a little effort. You will not regret it. If you're not doing the daily Bible reading with us, come on. Somebody said that I'm not being straightforward. 15 minutes a day is not enough. I can read my passage in about 15 minutes a day. If you need 20, it's still worth the effort. Okay. I want to be straightforward. <laughs> I want to close with a proclamation. Putting God's word in our mouths is one of the most powerful tools that we have. If you're not in the habit of memorizing scripture, it's a great habit to cultivate. You say, well, that's hard for me. Okay. Do it anyway. Well, I'm not as good at it as I used to be. Okay. Start where you are. Well, I forget. Okay. Put the scripture in your heart. It will help you. It will help you. And there's, you're going to need the help. You're going to need the help. Okay. Psalm, it's from Psalm 31. I think they're going to put it on the screens. We can read it together. Why don't you stand with me? This is our conclusion. You should smile. Okay. Psalm 31, we're going to read the first five verses. This is the declaration over our lives of what God says about us. Not how I feel, not how I think, maybe not even what my circumstances look like tonight, but this is God's declaration over my life. I trust him. All right. Psalm 31, one through five. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. We are triumphant in Jesus' name. 
Hallelujah. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.